from Global, leading Britain's conversation, The Nigel Farage Show. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Hope you're having a good Sunday morning. Um, are you confused by what's going on with Brexit? Do you know what the Prime Minister really stands for. And I ask that because a really fascinating poll out today. It's in The Independent on Sunday. Um, it's, it's carried out by a reputable polling group, BMG Research, and they interviewed one and a half thousand people. And when asked the question, do you know what Mrs May's Brexit plan is? Guess how many very strongly know and understand what her plan is? Well, it's 3%. And I'm wondering where they found them from, because 75% of you in this poll say they don't really know what her strategy is and what the end goal is. And I have to say, I think that reflects the position pretty clearly. You see, on the one hand, we get the Lancaster House speech, which we had in January of last year, where she set out very clearly... We're leaving the single market, we're leaving the customs union, we're getting on with it, uh, we've got this vision of a global Britain, uh, and that was all very clear. And then we get the Florence speech, where she basically says the European Union's absolutely wonderful, everything it does is terrific, and even though we're leaving it, we're going to rejoin various different parts of it, um, and we've had this ongoing series of negotiations that I think it's fair to say took a considerable turn for the worse during the course of last week. Firstly, we have the story about the punishment plan. Monsieur Barnier's plan that during the transition period, that's the period at the end of Article 50 that goes on for about two years, the Prime Minister wants, although I suspect it'll be, if we get it, until the next general election, that during that period of time, without recourse, even to their own court in Luxembourg, that the European Union would be able, if they thought we'd breach the rules, to do all sorts of things to us, like stop planes flying and stop trade. And I mean, frankly, it was something that really did very much back up the Jacob Rees-Mogg comment about us being a vassal state, a state that could be punished, a state that would have no say over laws and judgments that were being made over it. Um, uh, frankly, to me, any British government that was prepared to accept that uh, would have done a sort of Vichyite type deal. It would be completely and wholly unacceptable in every way. And yet, far from backing away, Mr Barnier decided on Friday that he frankly would simply double down. Uh, and he said, the time has come to tell the truth, he said. The only thing I can say, without the customs union and outside the single market, barriers to trade and goods and services are unavoidable. Which made me begin to think, perhaps we're simply wasting our time. Perhaps there isn't any point in going on with these conversations if he said already none of this is going to happen. If you remember, I went on the 8th of January to see Michel Barnier and I left that meeting with a distinct impression that he was not, not, not going to give anything, frankly, on financial services and perhaps other services as well. So in the light of all of this and stories and rumours about the number of letters that have gone into the chairman of the 1922 committee, and apparently we're quite close to a leadership bid being challenged, and given that only 3% of the nation understand what Mrs Bray's, May's Brexit plan is, um, I, I want to know this morning, you know, what do you want to hear next from Mrs May? Now, one man who has not been too shy over the course of the last few days in saying what he thinks is Lord Digby Jones of Birmingham, um, who tweeted yesterday, the EU want to punish us with no need for an ECJ ruling. If we break the rules of transition, can we have the same rights, please? for the years of cheating, re the rules, by France, Italy and Greece. He said earlier on in the week um, they want to have a unilateral sanction over us if we misbehave. The sheer bullying and hypocrisy of it. And he even went further than that and said, we need to be shot of the lot as quickly as possible. 
our country has previous on dealing with bullies. Well, joining me this morning, international businessman, crossbench peer in the House of Lords, former CBI Director General and Trade Minister under Gordon Brown. So, ma'am, let's spend a bit of time in those smoke-filled rooms in Brussels. Lord Digby Jones, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Good morning, everybody. Great to have you on the show, Digby, and great to have somebody on who has actually sat in those meeting rooms with European commissioners. And you, of course, visited Michel Barnier a couple of days after me, didn't you, in January? Yep, absolutely. And I I left uh, quite depressed, actually, because uh, I'm an optimistic bloke. And secondly, uh, having worked on the inside of all of this, my expectations were never high, you know. And and when I hear, you know, when I hear that what they're basically saying is, it's perfectly all right. We'll let the Remain camp and the media do the job for us. We don't need to do anything. Your country's at civil war, and all you need to do is just sit here and wait, and you'll get in. Then when you get them saying words like, we'll punish you if you transgress. And I have sat in these meetings, Nigel, over 20 years and watched the French cheat. I've watched the Spanish and the Greeks and the Italians cheat. And the nerve of it to say, well, if you break a rule, we'll... Yeah. And I was left with this impression that they will never allow any sort of deal on financial services. So was I. Yep, so was I. And so yet, was I. And, you know, and that, and that is 8% of the GDP of the country, if you like, the sales revenue of the country is 8%, but it's 12% of our tax take. So this is your genuine value added. And at the end of the day, if you think about it, they're really saying, we're not going to do that because at the end of the day, we've got one chance to help Paris and Berlin and Frankfurt. It's now. So we're going to punish you now. So we set it up for 30 years, knowing that you, at the end of the day, will give in. Because as, as, as I was left with this impression, Nigel, yep. you, you joined 43 years ago for trade, Britain. You've lived 43 years near you wanting trade. And you're leaving talking about trade. We are trying to build the United States of Europe. We want one army, one flag, one currency, one president. And we do not see this as trade and if there's less trade and more unemployment it's a price worth paying to build one country i don't want to belong to greater germany i don't want actually to belong to one country what i want is some dear friends in europe some good companies in europe creating work for an unemployed kid in athens and a single mum in madrid and I want, I want people listening to this all over the country, because you're a national radio station, I want you actually thinking in terms of we ought to get on with people in Europe. But you're not going to pull it off when what they want to do is punish us and bully us. And therefore, frankly, if business needs to know where it stands, I'll tell you where you stand. Behave like America, behave like Brazil, like China, like India. Let's do a deal from outside. And then they don't get the 39 billion either, Nigel. Well, no, absolutely. I mean, we have agreed in phase, so-called phase one, we've agreed to a whole series of concessions. But I'm just wondering, did we? I mean, I've, I've been making an argument now for a year that what we perhaps ought to try to do, uh, and maybe it is too late, I don't know, but what we should try to do, and certainly should have tried to do, is to go round the back of the European Commission, to get away from those glass and steel structures with tens of thousands of bureaucrats, all with their salaries and pensions and good lunches and all the rest of it. Because I'm very struck, you know, that the French wine producers, the German car makers, the Belgian chocolate manufacturers, they don't want their relationship with their best export market in the world messed up. Is it too late Digby Jones, for us to go directly to try to get some of those, you know, to try and get the French farmers, for example, to say to Macron, you know, if you go along with Barnier, you're damaging us. I guess I, I actually think there's something in that, but the people to do that, you know, are not politicians, and actually it's not really, Nigel, people like you and me. The people to do that are the Remain camp. The people to do that are the big businesses who fix Brussels for years with their lobbying, because they are the ones who have these business connections at the highest level. And more importantly, instead of the Remain camp doing its damnedest to hurt us, Mm. what they should be doing is actually saying, let us get the best possible deal on trade for Europe. Because this is going to hurt Europe too. And they're they're on this political journey, you know, about, about a united Europe. And if I hear one more hypocrisy from either Remainers or indeed other other people in the media saying, well, for some reason we can belong in a customs union and a single market 
and not subject ourselves to the no border control and submission to the European Court of Justice, just wake up and smell the coffee. I was left with this distinct impression from Monsieur Barnier that he is there and what he's actually going to do is show us through the door. He, they see us as having left and they see us as having left and his job is to show us through the door. And we are trying to sell them a pound of pears and they're trying to sell us a pound of apples. We're, we're not even talking the same language. And I, I just wish, you know, Remainers are not suddenly, you know, children of the devil with forked tails. I mean, Remainers are good, decent people. They don't agree with you and me, but it's not the no. point. They, and I want them to think what's in the best interest of the whole of Europe. And I think you're onto something. Well, maybe, Let's maybe we could get to, to that. Let's go and talk to Scandinavia. Yeah. Let's go and talk yeah. to... No, no, I, I, I mean, I'd love this to happen. But, but my feeling is that there is a lack of direction. There is an inconsistency coming from the Prime Minister and indeed from a cabinet that's very, very split. What, Digby Jones, do you think, in the face of, 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 of 75 percent of the country not understanding what our Brexit position is, with Barnier trying to bully us in the most extraordinary way, what do you want to hear from Mrs May? Well, I, you know, the most difficult person ever to negotiate with in life is someone who's got nothing to lose. And, and at the moment, Theresa May has got very little to lose. Now, everybody else in the Conservative government have got a lot to lose, a general election. The DUP have got a lot to lose, possibility of someone who they passionately hate, that's Corbyn, mm. being Prime Minister. Mm. And at the end of the day, the nation needs steering. So if I was Theresa May, what would I be saying now? I'd say, this is my stance. You will actually do this deal on these terms, that's financial services, that's services, and you do it with us outside the customs union, outside the single market, and therefore you can say we can control our borders and our judges. And if you don't, Mr. Barnier, with great respect, let's save everybody a lot of time. Yeah. And let's go and talk to the WTO. It'll do two things, Nigel. One is it will give business certainty. They could plan. Secondly, the world will go aghast for about 48 hours and say there ought to be 40 general elections by Friday. Hmm. And then when people calm down, they'll realise they've then got what we need, which is we know where we're going. It's called leadership, by the way. Yes. And then, and then what will happen is, for once, I think, Angela Merkel, Macron and the rest will have countries like Scandinavia and, 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 and the countries inside Scandinavia and also Poland and others coming to them and saying, hey, these boys are serious now. We've got to do something about it. Now, it might not mean that there's a deal. It might mean we do go WTO. But at least they know where we stand. Yeah, and at least we know where we stand, because right agreed, at the moment, agreed. the country is not sure. Can I just say, Lord Digby Jones, thank you so much for coming on with us this morning, for giving us your view. And I thought what was very interesting there was that Digby said it's called leadership. Tell us where we're going. Give us some clarity. And by the way, for those of you listening who say, isn't that typical? Nigel's got a lever on the show. Well, in the last few weeks, I've had Alistair Campbell for a whole hour, Lord Adonis for half an hour. In fact, we've been somewhat underrepresented, guest-wise, with levers. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's now 10.17. In the face of Michelle Barnier's bullying and the country being uncertain as to what her policy really is, what should the Prime Minister do? Let me know what you want to hear from Theresa May by calling me on 0345 6060 973. Maybe you think it's time for Mrs May to simply walk away, in which case you can text to 84850. Or maybe you think she should give in to Michel Barnier. Or perhaps in trade terms, we should call him Michel Barrier, in which case you can tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. You can watch us on Facebook and comment there too. Now, the big difference, of course, between LBC and all the other mass of radio and TV programmes that you get every Sunday morning, it's there, it's all politicians and journalists. And in some cases, it seems to be almost all Remainers. Remarkable that the Andrew Marr Show, which is a good show in so many ways, should have a debate this morning between a Tory and a Labour MP. The Labour MP, Chaka Ramuna, one of the most prominent anti-Brexiteers in the House of Commons, against the Tory. So there must have been a contest, but, oh no, he was against Anna Soubry, who, of course, is threatening uh, that she may have to leave the Conservative Party. And, and Miss Soubry said that she wants us to stay in the customs union uh, because uh, she worries otherwise we'll fundamentally undermine the peace process. And, and, and Ma asked her, you know, 
wasn't she surely closer to Mr Amuna than she is to Jacob Rees-Mogg? And she said, I'm not denying that. Well, I tell you what, no more politicians on politicians, no more journalists on journalists. This is for you, the great British public, to tell me what you want to hear from Mrs May. And let's start with Ken, who's calling from Barnet. Good morning, Ken. Good morning, Nigel. How are you? I'm fine, but I rather like Digby Jones, who I thought was excellent, by the way, before the break. I, I agree. I, he was fantastic. I, I mean, the one thing we desperately need now is clarity and leadership, because we haven't got any. Well, I, I come from two, uh, two angles. I actually wanted desperately to leave. Well, no, I didn't. I actually wanted a vote and hopefully to leave the EU. Yeah. We got the referendum. I was doing it for my children because I think we'd be a better country in the future by leaving. However, my son had just started a new business and he was desperately worried if we left, it could affect his business. So I actually voted remain. However, I was extremely pleased when we decided to leave. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, Ken, you couldn't lose, could you, really? Well, yeah. (laughs) I was was a typical European. I was sitting on the fence. (laughs) However... OK, so Ken, Ken, I mean, you, you know, you come at this from an unusual angle, but, but given where we are now, Ken, what do you want to hear the Prime Minister say in these speeches that she's now set to deliver? I would just like to hear a decision, and I would like the decision to be that we walk away now, we talk to the World Trade Organisation, and we get on with our lives. And I think Lord Digby echoed how I feel. You know, the chaos for about 48 hours as there was after the Brexit vote, and then everything calmed down. OK. Ken, you want clarity and leadership. Either we do this or we're gone. I think, I have to say, I'm very much coming to that point of view. I was very interested by a piece I saw on the Telegraph at the end of last week by Ambrose, Ambrose Evans Pritchard on the business desk. He says, we've reached the cliff edge. It's time for Britain to walk away. And he says it reluctantly, but what else, he says, can we do? Hi, Nigel. Theresa May is getting nowhere with Brexit. It's about time Theresa May walked away. Walk away now. Enough is enough, says Mary. Uh, She is not going to take any notice of the Brexit elite bully boys any longer. Well, that, I think, uh, Madeline, that, I think, actually would be the best message she could send to the country, because I really felt last week that with the punishment paper, and then the speech of Barnier, frankly, they were beginning to look down their noses at us, beginning to treat us with contempt. And I want to see the British Prime Minister stand up and say, do not speak to the British people who voted in a referendum like this. We are a proud nation. We will not be dictated to by an unelected bureaucrat like you. People would cheer, and they really, really would. Jerome is a first-time caller from County Cork. Good morning, Jerome. Good morning, Nigel. Uh, I'm a Remainer. Yep. And I have I have a question for you. Uh, I won't rant or anything. It's going to be a civilized question. The question I have is that uh, for many years, on and off, I've travelled, say, between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Now, if you hypothetically crash out of, say, you just leave the European union without any deal you just leave leave box stock and barrel yep. how do you resolve the problem of controlling your borders now you uh, all the leavers and arch brexiteers seem to say it's up to the republic to put up a barrier well, we're not well, leaving the european union no jerome and no jerome that's not true that's not true look nobody But nobody on the Leave campaign, least of all the DUP, is calling for the reintroduction of a hard border. Nobody. And I haven't, and I haven't, Jerome. And I was in Dublin. I was in Dublin for two days last weekend, um, and and meeting lots of political figures and and journalistic figures, and 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 nobody in the Republic wants a return to a border. The only people, Jerome, who seem the only people who seem to want a border are people like Michel Barnier. But how how do you, uh, hypothetically, how do you check people coming into Northern Ireland if you're going to control your border? How do you monitor people? I'm not talking about goods. 
I'm talking okay. about evil. Well, 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 Jerome, the answer to that, of course, is that Ireland is not part of the Schengen area. Uh, thank goodness. So people, you know, for example, if you get a car into Romania, you can drive it to Paris without it ever being checked through border after border after border. That is not the case with Ireland. Um, it's not part of Schengen. And anybody coming from the south into the north and then looking to try and get to the mainland has, has either got to get a boat, uh, you know, a ferry, or get an aeroplane. Um, I, you're right to say, if that route became something that was used for the illegal smuggling of people, that in some ways we'd have to act. But I do think the fact that the island of Ireland, you know, is there, surrounded by the sea, makes that problem very, very much easier. But, but Jerome, just, just one quick thing for you. I mean, isn't it remarkable that the Irish government aren't standing up and shouting at Brussels and saying, can we please have a tariff-free deal with the United Kingdom? Because otherwise, Irish agriculture could suffer horribly. But that's that's a possibility. But again, you're you seem to be slightly forgetting that the problem is that once say Britain is out of the EU, you're a different say legal entity. So in a sense, you're you've got the EU say as a, a legal entity, and then you've got the say Britain as a distinct. Legal entity. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, yes, you're right. Have, you're right. You're right. You're right. We'll be an independent yeah. country. How about that? Yeah, but if you're going to have different regulations, if you're going to have different, say, uh, barriers to trade or barriers, if you're going to uh, make life awkward, that's the problem, isn't it? But, but, Jerome, already, if we drive across that border... We've got a different tax regime. We've got a different currency. We live with that. And it's quite true. People drive north to the supermarket or south to the supermarket, depending on what Sterling Euro yeah, is doing. Yeah. So, you know, we manage it now. We can manage it in the future. Just briefly, Jerome, I mean, what would you, I mean, you know, and from a Remainer perspective, what would you want to hear Theresa May saying in these big set piece speeches? Well, I certainly would like that the uh, traffic between, say, all sorts of traffic, people, goods, between, say, the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland, yep. to continue as it is now. No barriers to trade. That's what I would like to okay. see, because it's, it's not only the peace process, but it's about uh, trade and, and all those sorts of different elements. Tourism, you know... Yeah. It's, well, it's, J it's Jerome, can I assure you? Can I assure you, Jerome, that's what I'd like to see as well. And actually, if we do, as you put it, crash out of the European Union without a, without a deal, maybe Ireland will have to consider its future, whether it might now not be better off leaving the EU too. I'm not saying it's on the agenda yet, but it will be a debate, I think, as time goes on. I certainly got that impression in Dublin last week. Thank you, Jerome. And again, civilised conversation with the Remainer. We try and be civilised here, if we possibly can be. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 10.30. Many of us are crying out for leadership and direction, as only 3% of people respond in a poll published in The Independent on Sunday saying they really know what the Prime Minister wants out of this Brexit deal. And all of that in the face of Michel Barnier, who is getting tougher and tougher and tougher, to the point, actually, where he might start to alienate many of the member states of the European Union, because a lot of them would like tariff-free trade to continue. But he's saying, frankly, unless we stay in the customs union and in the single market, namely, if we effectively ignore the Brexit vote, we can't do that trade without barriers. Walk away now, May, says Phil. Article 50, says David, gave us two years to prepare to leave the EU. There was nothing in the rules that mentioned the transition period. We should leave next year and make it very clear that we are. Let the EU do the running now. Well, David, you're quite right. You know, I thought Article 50 was the transition period. You know, it took us nine months to trigger it. We had two years, to, or up to two years, to sort everything out. And now Mrs May seems to be desperate for a transition period. I think because she's coming under pressure from quite a lot of the big banks and the big multinational businesses. And the argument that it's all going to take time and there's a lot to sort out is the one that seems to be getting the upper hand. But Barnier, you see, having threatened us that we couldn't move on to even talk about trade unless we agreed to the exit bill, the more, more jurisdiction for the European court, Barnier now is saying that we won't have a transition period. 
unless we accept, you know, basically regulatory alignment, namely all the rules will be the same. But we do need stronger messaging. I mean, I'm very struck today in the Sun newspaper, page four, David Wooding, you know, PM, give us a say or we won't pay. So saying we won't give the 40 billion unless we continue to have veto rights over some of the laws that were agreed before we actually left. So are we trying to have more of a say, or are we trying to go for a clean break? They are very, very mixed messages. Andy says, out means out, not halfway in. Yes, Andy, it's exactly the point, really, that I'm trying to make. Jen says, I want to hear her say, we want nothing, we will pay nothing, bulls in your court. Adam is calling from the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Nigel. The thing I'd like to hear Theresa May say, uh, short of resigning and a proper Conservative <laughs> like Jake Rees Mogg coming to power, oh. uh, short of that, because uh, that might not happen, I want her to grow a backbone and stand up and say, do you know what? We want to trade with you, we want to be friends with you, and if you want to keep putting these absurd obstacles in the way and keep disrespecting this country and, you know, proving again and again and again how undemocratic you really are, then we will walk away and we'll see how quickly the European Union turns itself apart when you don't get our money and the German taxpayers' economy, uh, taxpayers have to fill that hole, the void that we have left. Also, when we put World Trade Organization trade barriers in place, we'll see just how quickly the German car industry plummets and then the German GDP starts to go down, making it even harder for them to make those payments. And then we'll see all the other in countries fighting. And regarding what that bloke was saying earlier about the Irish border, yeah. it's very, very, very simple. Don't do anything. If they want to build a border and staff it and maintain it, let them. And we'll see just how quickly the Irish turn against them. Britain doesn't have to do anything with that border if it doesn't want to. Just let the European Union do it. And we'll see... They'll jump up and down about it because they are the ones who are destroying the Good Friday Agreement. We shouldn't be held to ransom to stay in a club that we no longer want to be in and we do not want to pay well, for just because of, um, you know... I think, Northern Adam, Ireland thing. E economic concerns aside, I think the way Barnier behaved last week, uh, not just with the leaked paper about potential sort of arbitrary justice that could be used over Britain. But with the speech he gave on Friday and his whole demeanour, didn't he prove the point, Adam, that unelected, arrogant, out of touch, elites in Brussels behaving like bullies is exactly why we voted to leave. And I suspect if we had a second referendum on this, why we'd do so by an even bigger margin. I thought it was an absolutely disgraceful display. And I just want the British Prime Minister to stand... Can you imagine... Can you imagine, as someone put it to me this morning, you know, if you were the chief executive of a company and your company had been talked to like that, you would go to war publicly with whoever had said it. And it's about time the Prime Minister, she doesn't need to go to war, but stood up and started to defend our rights and our integrity and our pride as a nation. Adam, I thank you for the call. Frustrated Brexiteer there in Adam. Brian is calling from Welling Garden City. Good morning, Brian. No, not Brian, actually. It's Russell. Oh, is it? Right, OK. Yes. Well, I, no problem. Well, no I tell problems. you what, you're on the line, Russell, and are you from Welling Garden City? I am indeed. Well, there you go. Well, well I tell you what, we got it half right. Which is, 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 I tell you what, I wish the Prime Minister was getting it half right. Russell, tell us what you think. OK, let's, uh, this is a, a lesson for the hard Brexiteers. Yep. But, 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 by the way, Brian, by the way, Brian, what is a hard Brexiteer? Russell, Russell. Russell. What is, what is a hard Brexiteer? Someone who wants to leave without any, um, any, any agreement whatsoever. Okay. All right, go on. Is it not? Well, well actually... Um, it, it's someone who wishes to go out and trade under WTO agreements. I don't think anybody had that as their first choice, but I think Monsieur Barnier and Brussels are making it Hang on a minute. impossible. Uh, I'm not interested. No, the hard Brexiteers are saying, go away. We don't want to know about you. Let's just leave the EU and that's it. Finish. Okay. That's the hard Brexiteer. True or false? Um, Russ, uh, have, let me say this, Russell. Nobody started with that position.
Everybody said it made common sense to continue with tariff-free business. But given, despite the trade imbalance, that Barnier and Co. made it impossible, that is, that is the view that many are now coming to, yes. Nigel, Nigel, please answer my question. People are saying, let's get out, let's leave the EU, we don't need them, let's just go straight to WT. That is the hard Brexit argument. True or false? Answer yes or no. The Brexit argument is, we wish to leave the European Union and be an independent country, and anything else is secondary to that. But let's just, right. but, but for the yeah, sake no, of, but for the sake sense. of your argument, for the sake of your argument, all right, there are many of us, and we just heard from um, Lord Digby Jones, and I quoted Ambrose Evans Pritchard in the Telegraph, there's a growing body of opinion, Russell, that we should stop wasting our time and just do it. So, so take that as a starting point and tell us what's wrong with that. Could, could I say something, please? Go on. You're just uh, talking over me. Everybody <laughs> you knows. You keep asking me a question. Should... No, well, you, yes, and I asked for a yes and no answer, and you wouldn't give it. You went off on some tangent. Now, <laughs> just let's get down to the basics. If we leave the EU without any agreement, we go to World Trade Organization international laws. True or false? Well, it's, it's, I, I didn't, didn't know it was a quiz, but uh, let's, let's, um, let, let, let's have a pop at true. Yeah. It's true. That means that we then have to go, under international law, to hard borders, because tariffs will come into play and we will have hard borders. Also, you do not wish to have any emigration, or immigration, whichever way you want to look at it, into our country from the EU. True or false? False. No, you don't. Excuse me, if you're under WTO... Uh, rules, you will have no immigration from the EU. No, 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 no. Russell, I'm sorry, you, you are now heading off into fantasy land. The point no, about... I'm not. The point that's, about being... That's, that's the reality. No, 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 Russell, please listen to me. The point about being an independent, sovereign, self-governing nation-state is you can decide who you do and do not want to let into your country. Yes, and you will have to have hard border. You will have to have a border which is pleased, totally and utterly pleased. You can't do it any other way than to have a border which is pleased. Um, well, I mean, I, I wish we pleased the border better than we do at the moment. Exactly. You see, you're, you're actually confirming what I'm saying. No, I'm not. A border and stopping any goods coming in except on the world tariff or um, world Russell. organization tariffs. Had it, had it occurred to you, had it occurred to you that when you see those incredible um, container ships going up the channel, I think some of them now take 20,000 containers, not hardly any of them come from the European Union. They're coming from China and all over the world. And do you know what? We manage yeah, we're, we're, we to are deal trading with it. already with the world, Nigel. Right. We are trading with the world. We trade with 56 countries under EU trade agreements that were made by the EU. Ru Russell, Excuse Russell me, if you I know very well I can buy any product I like more or less from the US uh, from the US and I can go buy it from China I just have to go on the internet and I can buy whatever I like mm. still today and it comes mm. via the post to me no problems whatsoever now once we go to world trade organization rules we then have to apply tariffs uh -huh. and those tariffs will have to be pleased which means we will have to have a hard border. And going to Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, what you're saying, oh, we can just continue as well, we are. Well, let's we deal. Let's deal with tariffs, Russell, shall we? Listen to me. Listen to me for a moment. No, no, we're not, no, no, we're not going to Northern Ireland, Ireland, Russell. You and I are talking about trade, and we haven't got time to do Northern Ireland as well. But let me just say this to you, that we don't actually have tariff-free trade with the EU, do we? Because we, we've been paying £10 billion a year for it. You just don't listen to anyone else. 
<laughs> well, I do. To... I do. I do. I do. I do. You're not listening to me. You're just you're just repeating the same old things, and you're not listening to me. You're refusing. You just talk over me all the time. All right, now, yeah. well, well, Russell, you, you, I mean, let, let's be fair. Ireland. You've had a pretty good run. I was talking about Ireland. I know, and we haven't got time. We haven't got time, Russell. You've had a long, long go at this, and you know, I take your point that World Trade Organization rules mean tariffs, and that is absolutely right. But we are living in the 21st century. We do trade with America and with China, and we deal with those tariff problems. I'm going to have to let Russell go. Don't like doing that, but sometimes you've got no option. What he didn't say is, under World Trade Organization rules, we could also cut tariffs. More of that in a moment. But for now, you're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's 10.47. Well, that last caller was lively. He called himself Russell. So we've been doing a bit of checking. And actually, he has phoned LBC before. And he used to be called Brian. But he called himself Russell, I think, for the purposes of today to try and get through the switchboard. But he had a lot of opinions. And Tim in Marlow says, Russell had the beating of you. As usual, you avoided his questions. Well, I did my best, but there were so many of them. I mean, it was like, like University Challenge. I mean, it was quite difficult. Um, and there wasn't much time to answer them. Nigel, I'm a Remainer, but that guy was ridiculous. Demanding yes or no answers is totally unreasonable, isn't it? Yes or no? Yes. And that's from James in Romania. <laughs> Very good. Uh, obviously in a very wealthy postcode somewhere in London, I would have thought. Um, the, 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 the idea that under World Trade Organization rules uh, we won't have any immigration from the European Union, as being suggested to me, is clearly total and utter baloney. But we keep hearing, folks, we keep hearing about tariffs, Barnier or barrier, as we should call him, saying unless we stay in the in the customs union of the single market, namely if we don't leave, there are going to be tariffs. Oh dear, you know, big red cross. Uh, World Trade Organization rules, tariffs, tariffs, extra cost, extra cost. What no one's telling you is this, that as members of the European Union, which is not a free trade club, because we pay £10 billion a year for the benefit of tariff-free access, and those total tariffs are less than the money we pay in. But the idea the European Union is about free trade is actually blown out of the water by something called the Common External Tariff. And they are tariffs that the European Union puts on goods that come into the European Union from all over the world. Only by being outside of the European Union can we get rid, totally, or reduce that common external tariff. Leaving the European Union, reducing the common external tariff means cheaper shoes, cheaper bras, and cheaper food. Actually, actually those, those who spend the highest proportion of their household income on food, on children's clothes, on all of those things, are the ones that would benefit the most from us leaving the European Union, getting rid of that common external tariff, and having cheaper consumer goods. And I think now that we've moved on to this phase, where it's beginning to look to be impossible to do a deal with Barnier, unless something miraculous happens in the space of the next few weeks, we need to start having that debate. I'm going to go to Mark in Basildon. Mark, are you really called Mark? Oh, I am actually, Nigel, and you are you are a political hero of mine. Right. Um, I just want to move on. Now, now, don't interrupt me, okay? Oh, oh no, I promise I won't, Mark. <laughs> joke. Or Bill, or whoever you are. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with Digby Jones. I'm I'm a small medium business um, uh, managing director. Fifteen million turnover. It took me forty mm. years to do it. Uh, like any company, like a country, it needs leadership. It needs someone at the helm. It needs somebody to stand up and say what we're going to do. And, and basically, without that, a rudderless ship goes nowhere. Now, the thing is, with, with all this threatening behaviour from, from the Europeans, I will not be ruled. I, I, I voted to stay in. I am now a staunch Brexiteer. I, I, I do not believe that the amoeba that, that run this, the, the, certainly the media, some of the media... A lot of the public, some of them of which ring up this station, mm. have no faith in our business quality. The amount of quality that we've got in companies that run businesses, people like me even, that, that basically have no faith in, 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 in our country. And that really boils me. And then when I get the Europeans threatening us, how dare they? Is that what's turned you, Mark? Well, 
It's, but is it their behaviour that's turned you from a Remainer to a Lever? I do. Cameron went over there and he tried to explain to them, look, you know, everybody was saying, you're better off within and change within. They were never interested in the UK. They were never interested in our political system. They were never interested in, in, in fair play with the UK. We were just a cash cow. It's got to stop. And, and what worries me, Nigel, if this was 1938, 39, would, if, with the same political background now, we would have been amoebas ourselves. We never would have got involved in the Second World War to stop well, Germany from doing what they did. Well, there are many Mark that would say there are many Mark that would say that from 1933 through to 1939, uh, we found it very difficult to stand up and confront reality, and those that did were pilloried. Um, ex- excluded in many ways from polite society, considered to be warmongers and lunatics. So, thing is, Mark, if ever you take on a consensus, uh, you, you find they throw a shed load of abuse at you. I just want to say, just believe in our country, please, people. Let's yeah. get on with it. Right. And is that your message to Mrs May, Mark? Is that Absolutely. your message to Mrs May? Perfect. Mark, I thank you very much indeed for that. And I've got time to go to Geoffrey in Chelsea. Good morning, Geoffrey. Good yeah, morning. Um, yeah, I want to comment on this Irish question, which seems to keep arising. Yes. That people think is such a, an impossible hurdle. Um, but I, I mean, I'm no expert on this, but uh, Britain and the Republic of Ireland had an open border since the 1920s. Yes, it's, so co- it's, I, I it's the common travel area. It's impossible to maintain. Yeah, it's the common travel area. We need no lessons from Brussels in how to manage the Irish border, do we? Indeed not. I think, I think over time there were some hiccups, perhaps, in when tariffs might have been slapped on, you know, for a year or two here and there, but they were always quickly worked out. So I don't think it is, it's a problem. As far as I can see, no one, on whether Remainer or uh, Lever, wants a hard border there. The only people who seem to be talking about imposing a hard border or its necessity uh, are the EU. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I've seen this again and again and again. And even if we do finish up, and we may well, uh, with tariffs on goods that move north and south of the border, you know, given technology we can deal with it. Very interesting, Geoffrey. I mean, think about Canada. You know, Canada and America, huge numbers of goods going back and forth across, you know, sort of Detroit northwards over that bridge. And whilst there's a NAFTA agreement, there are lots of areas that are not covered by free trade, and they have a system in Canada where half an hour before you cross the border, somebody from the company inputs into, into a computer the goods that are coming in and the tariff is automatically charged. It's not beyond the wit of man, Jeffrey, is it? For us to sort this Indeed out. Not. And, I mean, Sweden and Norway have a border which is yep. far longer than, than the Irish border, and yep. they seem to manage with, uh, with none or virtually yep. no checks. Yeah, no, absolutely. Geoffrey, thank you for, for, for making that point. The common travel area, as Geoffrey says, has been around for a long time. I also strongly think that an exception should be made. If you believe in the political sensitivity of the, of the Good Friday Agreement, then why don't the European Union, if they believe in that, say, whatever happens, we'll make sure there's tariff-free access for Ireland but with, with their trade with the United Kingdom. And I'd love to see that, but hey, um, I'm not so sure that's going to happen. Bill says, think again, Nigel, and cancel Brexit. Well, I tell you what, uh, this debate's gone well. In the next hour, we will talk about John McDonald's call yesterday to bring back nationalisation on a massive scale, something he says won't cost the country any money. But I think we'll carry on with this debate. What is it you want to hear from Mrs May? Is it we're going to walk away unless you start behaving sensibly? If it is, call me on 0345 973 Or perhaps you think it's all been a terrible mistake, as Bill does, and we should stay part of the European Union. And I think, after the top of the hour and after the news, I'll tell you what I want Mrs May to say. So Mrs May is going to give some big set piece speeches. And I'm asked on Facebook by Shara Luta, she says, Nigel, what is your vision? Because every Ramona seems to know what they want. Every Ramona says, we respect the result of the referendum. But we'll do our best to undermine it. It seems to me to be the position of most of the Ramonas. Uh, Perhaps that's unfair. I don't know. If it is, I've no doubt you, the callers, will tell me. What do I want to hear? from Mrs May. I'd like Mrs May in the speech to say, I've tried as Prime Minister to respect the referendum result. 
whilst doing so in a way that brings not just the country, but my cabinet together. We did, in phase one of these negotiations, make far more concessions than I'd intended to do at the start, particularly promising up to £40 billion of money as part of our exit fee. We've applied for a transition deal after Brexit, just to attempt to make the whole process smoother. And yet, every single time we give... All you do is throw sand back in our eyes. And frankly, what the European Union's chief negotiator did last week is a massive insult to the people of this country. And we simply cannot and will not put up with it. Brexit was primarily about getting the independence of the United Kingdom back from the European Union. Economic debates were a secondary concern, important though they are. But I did say in my Lancaster House speech last year that no deal was better than a bad deal. Perhaps in Brussels you've forgotten that. Well, actually, I mean it. Um, And we're running up to this summit on the 22nd and 23rd of this month where we're going to talk about trade. Unless you're prepared uh, to show that you really do want to have a sensible, rounded trade deal, then we'll be forced to walk away at the end of March next year without any deal at all. Uh, We're going to immediately start talking to the World Trade Organization about putting things in place. Uh, We've decided that actually a transition is not what the British public voted for. We will be leaving on March the 29th next year. Let's all be grown up and try and do it as sensibly as we can. That is what I would like to hear the Prime Minister say in these speeches. That there is still one last chance. We have the big summit at the end of the month. But we start to get to a point, as the months run out, where actually, even moving to World Trade Organization rules, there wouldn't be time to sort out the nuts and the bolts. So I do think we're approaching uh, pretty much crisis point on this in many, many ways. Colm is calling from Omar in Northern Ireland. Good morning. Hello, Nigel. Good morning. So what what would you like to hear the Prime Minister say? Uh, well, if you would just leave her alone, I, she tried to get the best deal, I think, for you. you know, well... The uh, reason she's ha- having to, you know, give up on stuff because you need it. You need it, Nigel. You're going to be... And uh, can I just say, you're disillusioned about Northern Ireland and Ireland. You keep going on about... <laughs> Oh, we're going to join you. Oh, I'm not disillusioned. Colm, I'm not disillusioned. I had a fantastic time in Dublin last week. There was a couple of people there who don't know what's wrong with their heads. But you're saying, Nigel, you haven't told the people, like, a United Ireland is coming. It's going to be the Brexit because of Brexit. Either way, if we get a bad deal, you know, the majority of Northern Ireland voted to stay in the EU. But if the DUP push for it, well, do you know what? Do you know what? You say that, right? But I heard this argument about Scotland. Ah, yeah, but hang on, Nigel. Scotland voted to stay in the European Union. Therefore, the Brexit vote will mean that Scotland will separate from the United Kingdom. In fact, that now looks less likely than it has for many, many years. Because up against the wall, the Scots voter will say we'd rather be with the United Kingdom than part of that European Union. Uh, and so I feel that the union between Scotland and England is actually much stronger since the Brexit vote. And whilst there are huge debates and concerns, both sides of the border, um, I, I, I wouldn't be so certain, Colm. The inevitability is a United Ireland. I mean, if, we're going to give it, if it's going to be catastrophic for us in, in the North, you know, why would we, you know, Turkey's voting for Christmas, why, why would we well, go along with it? And the converse may be true, Colm. If it works out really well for the UK, maybe Ireland will say, do you know what? We're now a net contributor. We've lost a huge fishing resource. Uh, Most of our trade isn't denominated in euros anyway. It's all been a mistake. I don't know. We will have to see. Nigel, watch Anna Subri on Mar today, supporting Remain again. Has she forgotten that her constituents voted leave? Or didn't their vote mean anything to her, says Phil, in North Wales? Yeah, I mean, my comment was that it was a bit odd for the BBC to have Labour and Tory in both Remainers on, but hey, question time on Thursday night was four Remainers and one Lever, so I don't know. Um, I think the caller Russell fails to understand that WTO will be better for us, says John from Wales. At the moment, John, WTO is being put up as a great bogeyman. It's a cliff edge! We're going to fall off into the abyss! Life will be impossible, as I've tried to point out. Actually, by getting rid of the common external tariff and making people's weekly shopping baskets better, uh, there might just be... 
once that argument gets out there, a bit more support for WTO rules. Kim says, why the hell are you not part of the negotiations, Nigel? Come on! As if to say, I've been shirking. Kim, I've said from day one, I would do anything I could to help this government, whether it was with Brexit whether it was with relations with um, the administration in the White House, and boy, relationships there are not very pretty. But, Kim, this government, they don't want me to do anything. They're, I mean, I, I'm afraid I'm just not up to it for the snobby old Tories. So there we are. Dot says, with half her cabinet on the side of the EU, what chance does May stand? I think it's more than half Dot, if you really look at the numbers. Um, Sally is calling from Kingston. Good morning, Sally. Good morning, Nigel. Lovely to talk to you. Um, first thing I'd like to say is I don't think there's anybody better than you that could be on um, the negotiating team, but there we are, there we have what there we, we have. Yeah. But the second point is, why aren't we hearing uh, all that's happening in Europe just now? There's massive crisis. There's still the Greek crisis with no money. Um, there's Italy coming up with the same situation, massive emigration, problems with the people who have emigrated um, into the country, you know, the illegal immigration I'm talking. Yep. And, and, you know, we we all the time talking about how Britain's going to be this and that and how terrible everything is for poor British people. Look what's happening in Europe. Why aren't, why aren't any of the newspaper or anybody talking about the real situation well, in Europe just now? Well, I suppose, Sally, to be fair, there is, some, you know, there is growth back in the Eurozone. So they uh, uh, well, I think there is a bit of growth back in the Eurozone. And certainly one or two countries like Portugal you know, have turned themselves around a little bit. But there are political crises in, in, in oh, Europe, it's Sally. Germany for a start. <laughs> well, I saw Martin Schulz, my old friend from the European Parliament, who said he wouldn't join the coalition, and then decided he would join the coalition. And guess what? He'd be foreign minister, and now he's not going to be the foreign minister or, indeed, leader of the SPD party for very much longer. So Germany is basically without a government still months after the election. Um, and the other big battle um, that, 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 that no one's noticing, Sally, is what's going on in Hungary, where a very, very strong Prime Minister is saying no to the European Union. We will not accept migrant quotas from you. We will not pay for Mrs Merkel's mistakes. And where there is a very public war of words between him and George Soros going on um, on a very high level. And, and, of course, Sally, I almost forgot, we've got the elections in Italy taking yeah. taking place on March the 4th, where it looks like the Five Star Movement, uh, you know, the brand new or relatively brand new political party, uh, are probably going to top the poll. Yeah. And, and possibly 81-year-old, though he doesn't look 81, I'm not, could be to do with the facelifts, I'm not sure, but 81-year-old Berlusconi could become the Prime Minister again. The thing that um, really interests me is the fact that Eastern Europe, who have had mass emigration into Britain and out of into other countries as well, you know, France has had similar, but um, but they don't want any immigration into their countries. They must be empty. <laughs> well, I, it depends where you go, houses. Sally. It depends where you go. I went to Lithuania two or three years ago talking to the Prime Minister, and he said, yeah, over 20% of our people have left the country. And I did see in the rural bits of Lithuania, you know, boarded up houses, uh, you know, pl places empty, because the trouble with Lithuania isn't just that they've lost a fifth of the population, they've lost most of their young doctors, most of their young lawyers, they've lost their, you know, they've lost so much mm. of their young talent. So that is a massive problem. But, but the Hungarian argument isn't so much about numbers, it's about culture. And the argument goes uh, that if you take large numbers of people from countries, Middle Eastern countries particularly, where um, attitudes towards women, um, attitudes towards society as a whole are completely different, and if you think you can take large numbers of people from those backgrounds and integrate them within your communities easily and peaceably, well, Viktor Orban looks at what's happened in Germany, particularly looks at what's happened in some towns in Sweden, and just says, no, we're not going to do this. So, so, Sally, I would say that, that we had the Eurozone crisis. You're quite right that Greece is a disaster zone, and many other parts of the Mediterranean have suffered, but I do think the EU has a big political crisis on its hands, and I thank you for the call. Sam is calling from Worthing. Good morning, Sam. Oh, hi, Nigel. Nigel, I voted Brexit, but I think we need to be a bit more realistic about uh, this argument. I don't want to get on the emotional side of it. I was just reading about WTO on your website. All member states have to have a high border. You know, kids coming in will have to be policed. I think it's quite clear. We either come in, come out cleanly, 
or we stay in. There's no in yes. between or well, no. Well, well, they are the two choices, Sam, as you put it. Um, there is the possibility, of course, or there should logically be the possibility of a trade deal. But, but, but ultimately, ultimately, Sam, you know what we voted. The vote was political, right? It was a po- Brexit was a political vote to leave political union, um, and if that means WTO, then it means WTO. Well, if it means WTO, then how do we deal with the, you know, Ireland issue? I mean... Uh, ah, but Sam, you know, but Sam, it, but Sam, there is a difference you, you here. You have an exception, I mean... Yes, you, you oh, yes, you can. We've had, come on, Sam, we've had, on and off, a common travel area with Ireland for about 95 years. We've made an exception for Ireland in a whole host of ways because of our shared and yet very complicated right. history. I understand that, but it seems to be to have a WTO exception or a rule change. All member states ah, will have to use no, it. No, agree, no, Sam, which Sam. Which EU member states in that as well. Sam. So I, think, I think we need to be a bit more honest. No, no, I let's be honest. The WTO, the WTO has within it exceptions that can be made in cases of political sensitivity. And I think, Sam, we can make that case in Switzerland of political sensitivity, ma- making the point that the Good Friday Agreement has made life there a damn sight better than it was before. We've got to do all that we can to preserve it. And I think, Sam, I think the WTO, I can't promise you, but I believe they'd be on our side. After all, their primary role is to make trade easier across the world. But I thank you for the point. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 11.16. Well, whilst we ponder what Mrs May should say in these set-piece speeches that are lined up in response to mass confusion in this country as to what the government's real position is and increasing threats from Monsieur Barnier, uh, it is a very fair question to ask, where does Labour stand on all of this because I thought during the manifesto uh, launches before the last election they were perfectly clear we're leaving we're leaving the single market we're taking back control of our borders much of that has changed um, shadow charts of John McDonnell has been on ITV's Peston on Sunday this morning uh, and he said a second Brexit referendum would divide the country again adding those divisions are really still there okay then he says The better route is to have a general election. We'd never turn our back on democratic engagement, he said, but added that he would worry about opening up the potential of right-wing xenophobia. Okay. Uh, McDonald said, well, I think it better we have a general election. Better we have a general election on the issue and all the other issues because you can then have a wider debate as well. I think what he means is... Yeah, I know that millions of you voted for us, saying we'd leave everything, but actually, we've completely changed our minds now. Um, Our intention now is to keep Britain part of a customs union and some form of the single market. But rather than coming back to you for a second referendum, uh, we would like a general election and perhaps a coalition with the SNP to put that in place. However angry and upset some leavers are with the sheer indecision, frankly, of Mrs May. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm conscious there are more than 4 million people, considering more than 4 million people, that voted Labour at the last election, who had voted Brexit the year before. And I suspect they, in many ways, are going to finish up being the angriest of all. That's what I think, because I can see the direction that the Blairite Parliamentary Party is taking Mr Corbyn in. And, you know, it's pretty clear he seems to be up for being the next Prime Minister, doesn't he? Not sure that he will, but hey. Stanley is calling from Belfast. Good morning, Stanley. Hello there, Nigel. I'm the old hero there. Uh, Nigel, I, I don't understand how the, the border, as it's constituted at the minute, can be a template for any future border. Because currently, uh, the border the border is, 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 a, is a criminal corridor. It's, it's, a, it's a border for smugglers, petrol, petrol uh, for cigarette smugglers, yes. cattle rustlers. Yes. And, and in fact, it costs our economy here. A hundred million a year uh, and lost taxes on, on diesel smuggling, and and the according to the Irish Times, it costs the the Irish board, the Irish economy nine hundred thousand euros, <laughs> nine hundred million euros. Can you believe uh, in, in smuggling? But after Christmas, we had the case where uh, 
a, a guy, from, an Egyptian guy came over from England, came down through Northern Ireland, went to Dundalk, murdered a, a Japanese student, stabbed two, two of his friends, uh, and the Irish authorities have no idea when that man came through the border. Mm. And in fact, you'll not believe it, but the local TDs were saying the border, as it is constituted at the minute, is a threat to our national security. So, actually, the, the, the border in Northern Ireland is a red herring. OK, Stanley, I mean, I, mean, I mean, your point is a valid one, because, as I said earlier, you've got a different tax regime, north and south, you've got a different currency, north and south, which fluctuates. So whether it's illegal smuggling or whether it's consumer choice, there is a lot of, you know, changeable cross-border, um, you know, m- movements of money. I understand that. Uh, Stanley, what everyone's scared of is they see the lack of border checks as being part of the benefit of the Good Friday Agreement and don't want to turn their backs on that. Well, uh, uh, Nigel, anybody in Northern Ireland, nobody in Northern Ireland when they voted on the Good uh, Friday Agreement had a slightest consideration for, uh, for the European Union. And nobody in their no. right mind, nobody ever dreamt that they were being, they, they had to accept every machination and change in the European Union, they didn't vote for the for a single uh, uh, for for a United Europe. No, no. Well, Stanley, you're quite right. You, you see, you see, Stanley. I go to Brussels, right? I go to Brussels, where in the European Parliament, speakers get up and say, we only had the peace agreement in Northern Ireland because of our work here in the European Union. They've done their absolute best for 20 years to claim credit for something that, in my opinion, was brokered by the Americans, a process actually that began with John Major and went on through Tony Blair. So, Stanley, they're trying to rewrite history in a way, aren't they? Absolutely. Uh, And, uh, like, the peace process here has become... It's it's like feeding the crocodile. And, unfortunately, the the subsidies that the the British government and the European Union have used uh, European subsidies to put money to uh, terrorist organisations to stop them, to keep them quiet, to stop them from bombing and stop them from shooting people. But it, it hasn't worked. And, and people are, are, are actually, even people in Northern Ireland now are actually asking for uh, uh, the, the Good Fight Agreement to be reformed because it's an agreement that suits 20 years ago and the, okay. the whole world has changed and Northern yeah. Ireland has yeah. changed and we need a, re- a reform not only of the European Union but... Uh, the Good Friday Agreement, and nobody in Northern Ireland would call it a Good Friday Agreement because when policemen were shot as bargaining chips, you can't you can't refer that to the Good Friday Agreement. Right. Okay. Listen, Stanley, you've made some very valuable points there. And Stanley, sir, I was talking earlier about the fact with different currencies and taxes, there is a lot of this cross-border trade. And Stanley was saying, actually, it's being used outright in the black market for smuggling. And he hasn't got a problem at all with a border there that is policed in some way. Um, If Ireland does not like the idea of a hard border, then leave the European Union. They would not look back, says Richard, in East Sussex. Um... Uh, William says on Twitter, having given it some thought, I've concluded that Brexit is a destructive decision that we will not take. Well, I tell you what, if the Prime Minister wants to get up in one of these speeches and say, actually, it's been a terrible mistake, we're not really going to leave at all, goodness knows what the political backlash in this country would be. Do not underestimate at some point in time the potential anger and power of those who despite being told by the international establishment they shouldn't do it voted for brexit there are millions of people out there getting frustrated millions more watching and waiting lenny is calling from ashford in kent good morning lenny good morning sir uh what it is I've been a conservative all my life, yep. and that, and when Theresa May made her maiden speech, I went great. That is exactly everything I wanted to hear. But I've got documentary evidence that it didn't mean a thing, not a thing, Nigel. When you say documentary then, evidence, Lenny, well, what it is, I mean, I've I've been on this pro uh, on LBC many times. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to create jobs and build houses on brownfield sites for many years. Yeah. And conservative policy doesn't mean a thing. What they say doesn't mean a thing. All right. And, uh, and if anybody ever wants it, I'll gladly come to anyone's office and show them. You'll have the shock of your life. All right, so they haven't delivered for you on, Bram- on brownfield development. Um, 
what would you but in terms of brexit and 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 i do agree the whole business agenda is part of that what would you like to hear us say lenny i mean you were pleased with her from the sounds of it her lancaster house speech a year well, ago i don't I, I don't think she can say anything because no the european don't respect her because she's been so weak you've got to put someone up against europe who they respect and they know you mean it and not and she's not the right person no no, 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 I'll be quite honest. I mean, this chap, is, uh, he, he stands there. We've got no one to say to him, Oi, sunshine, the party's over, <laughs> and I mean what we say. <laughs> and that is it. Well, I think, Lenny, I'd rather agree with that. Thank you. I've got time to go to Peter in Sunningdale. Good morning, Peter. Uh, Oh, good morning, uh, no, Jim. I'm a great fan. Uh, it's the first time I've ever spoken to anybody well, on the radio, so if you could, could bear well, with me a second. Welcome. Um, You're on LBC, Peter, but just think uh, we're having a conversation. Now, what should... <laughs> just, just yes. in a couple of sentences, what should she say? Uh, well, I think she's obviously got to tell them that we are a great country, and we've always been a great country, and I'm absolutely disgusted. Uh, my wife is French, and we uh, have spent a lot of time in the south of France, and we know many, many people across the, 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 the Europe. Uh, most of them would like to get out of Europe. Uh, so this idea that there's some sort of utopia within Europe is, is absolute rubbish. Um, and the other thing I would like to say is that many of them have said that they don't like the tyranny of the Germans. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of people that feel that most of the countries in Europe have been dominated by the Germans, and uh, I, some of them even say there's a jackboot on their throat. So uh, I think that we've got to stand up and say, look, we are British, we can uh, deal with the rest of the world. And one other thing I would say is that it really annoyed me a years, uh, some time ago when David Cameron said to you about um, racism. Oh, and yeah. When I was at school, racism was African, Asian, Australasian and European. And as far as I'm concerned, it is the Remainers that are actually racist. Well... Are the people that do not want to deal with other people around the world. They want to deal with the supremacists within Europe. Well, I don't know whether they're racist or not, Peter, but what I do know is they want to build a big European state and we voted against it. And I thank you for coming on the radio. See, it wasn't too bad, was it? And any of you that have never, they've never done it before, it's 0345 6060 and it's like having a chat over a cup of tea or something else, whatever. I think we've done as much as we can on that. Uh, we need clarity of direction and leadership from our Prime Minister. She needs to deliver it very, very quickly. But in a moment, I want to discuss John McDonnell, not his thoughts on the European Union, but his thoughts on public ownership. Labour plans to bring back into public ownership many services, and he says it can be done without costing the taxpayer a penny. We'll have a look at that right now, but for the moment, you're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's now 11.30. And so the Cheno Chancellor, John McDonnell, uh, who I'm, I suppose fair to say is a strong left winger, uh, and he has said that Labour is going to take privately run services back into public ownership, and it's going to cost absolutely Nothing. Shadow Charles McDonald says that's because each company would be a publicly held asset. I have to say, I don't understand quite how that works, but hey, he insists he's not taking us back to the huge centralised bureaucracies of the 1970s. Here was him earlier today. What we're looking at is much more about how we manage our public services in a devolved way, where you bring together, well, representation from passengers or consumers, the workers themselves, and expert management with democratic involvement, particularly through local authorities. Now, you know, this guy is way out on the left of the political spectrum. This guy is a Marxist. I'm, look, I'm straight, I'm honest with people, I'm a Marxist. You know, I've been, this is a classic... Mark, crisis of the economy. That's it. Capitalist crisis. Oh dear, crisis. oh dear. I've been waiting for this oh for dear, a generation. Oh dear, oh dear. For Christ's sake, don't, don't waste it. Yeah. You know, let's use this to explain to people oh. this system based on greed and profit does not work. 
No, well, the communist one wasn't that great either, McDonnell, was it? Really? You know, state-run everything. Um, terrible po poverty. Um, falling behind technologically. And thank goodness, in the end, that centralised, planned economy, the Berlin Wall came down and the lives of many people improved pretty quickly. So I'm, I'm worried that we have somebody very much on the extreme of politics in a position like this uh, i'm also personally going to question in a huge way whether mass public ownership is something that actually works you know when i was in my teens i remember british leyland british leyland was the state-owned car uh, maker i remember a speech that keith joseph gave or Sir keith joseph gave a sort of conservative free market thinker pointing out that British Leyland would lose £500 million this year and British Leyland would lose £500 million again next year. And that actually, when it came to making motor cars, the free market and fear of going bankrupt was actually better than the state subsidising it year on year on year. And I bought into that argument. And I think if you take areas like telecoms, you know, that were run by the state, that have gone into private um, hands back in uh, sort of 35 years ago. Um, actually, there's far more choice within the telecoms market with, as a free market than there would be state run. I worry with some things, um, such as railway tracks, whether actually you really can have genuine competition. Uh, and it sort of strikes me that if you want to get a train up to Milton Keynes, there's about three different companies. You would almost need a degree to work out what train you, you, you're going to get on. So I'm, you know, I don't think that, the, that, that there are not things that the state should run and run well. But the idea of us going back to mass privatisation, I think, is a really big, big worry. And I'm really curious... He says it would cost us nothing because they'd be publicly held assets. So, all right, I'm a shareholder in a company that gets nationalised. Is McDonald telling me I wouldn't get compensated for those shares? Um, and, oh, oh, yes, but actually, Nigel, don't worry, because we'll all own a piece of it, because it'll be owned by the country. That would amount to theft. So I'd love to hear more of his plans. I'm concerned about this direction of travel, but I know there's been a growing demand from a lot of younger people, that things should be nationalised. And, and, and I'm kind of guessing that's because they haven't lived through the days where we saw many things that were nationalised that didn't work terribly well. Ruth is calling from North Yorkshire. Ruth, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Big fan of yours, actually. <laughs> I just wish we could get on with Brexit. But well, we, that we, we finished with that discussion, yeah, Ruth. <laughs> anyone who wants to re-nationalise the railways has yeah. never travelled on the Dartford Loop Line in the 1950s and 60s. And the reason they were privatised was when John Major did it in a hurry because he knew he was going to get defeated at the election. And the, under the EEC rules, I think I'm right in saying that you can't have nationalised industry. Well, and they made a complete yeah, all yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. What 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 the EU rules said was that the same company could not own the track and the services, and they had to be separated out, was what the EU directive said. Um, so tell me about the 1950s and 60s on the Dartford Loop line, Ruth. <laughs> well, you had to force your way into the carriages, and they were dirty, and they were late, and they were always going on strike, and you never knew whether you were going to get home within reasonable time or not, or even get to work at reasonable time or not. Or not. You'll know the Dartford Loop line, yeah. don't you? Yeah, I know. Yes. I mean, Ruth, I have to say, generally... I think the railways are better, they are uh, better than they used to be. I know there's been yeah. some big exceptions. I mean, that Brighton line's been dreadful. Um, and for some reason, the East Coast line keeps on going bust for reasons that are... very good, actually. I use it quite a lot. Uh, and it is good. The trains are clean. They're on time. The but I wonder whether... I wonder whether, yeah, I mean, is it really privatisation? It's actually, it's actually a series of franchises, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I, uh, to be honest, I don't know yeah. how it works, but it seems to. And, um, it, yeah, it's certainly a lot better. I mean, it's expensive, but... Very. Uh, I think... Uh, I mean, uh, in a way, I can see the reason that people think it will be better, all this money going to shareholders, but we were subsidised in the railways. That's why nothing ever got done, because well, we never any money for No, it. but we still are in terms of track updates and stuff. Oh, yes. Well, you see, the track is the expensive bit, isn't it? That's mm. why they closed the lines, because 
I don't think railways have well, ever made any money anywhere. I'm they? also guessing, Ruth, that Corbyn, that uh, that um, Macdonald and Corbyn are talking about, you know, electricity, power, water, all of these things. I mean. Ruth, um, if you can remember the 50s and 60s on that Dartford loop line, you were of an age, you were of an age when you'll remember when the state owned an awful lot of stuff. Do yes. you think the state would run water and power supplies better than the free market? No, there was never any investment in anything. Okay. No, 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 Ruth. Because there was never any money for it. No, Ruth, I think you're right. I think generally... Generally, most of our services are better. There are limits. There are limits to privatisation, but the idea of turning the clock back, I'm not sure it works. And certainly, I don't see how it can cost absolutely nothing unless they're going to steal our shares off us. Sam is calling from Stoke on Trent. Good morning, Sam. Morning, Nigel. Nice to speak to you again. Nice to speak to you. Yeah, I think the problem is that we don't. People don't realise that we haven't actually got a free market capitalist no. system. We've got crony capitalists. So that's the problem. Uh, I learned this looking into 2008. Yep. If we had a proper free market system and not corrupt and, and laws were enforced, it'd be a lot better. I mean, I don't know much about the train um, in the past because I'm, I'm 40. I can't really remember. What, it's, I'm too young. But aren't the, the franchises getting away with um, making loads of money and the services down? It's just bad. It, I think the, the like, and rail track, it just seems to be badly run. But that's yeah. I mean, I think, Sam, it may be badly run, but those of us of a certain age can remember it being absolutely awful. Um, but, 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 Sam, your point is a really powerful one. Uh, we, we are not living in an age of free market capitalism. We're living in an age... I call it corporatism. You call it crony capitalism. But it amounts to the same thing. It amounts to the big businesses and big government acting and working hand in glove to the detriment of many small and medium-sized competitors. So, so when, when McDonald criticises capitalism in the way that he does, um, I, I'm not sure he understands just how much that's changed. No, I mean, like, uh, like 2008, Iceland, they did the right thing. Because you can tell it's a, cr- a crony capitalist system because it's too big to fail. Yes, 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 yes. And in yes. a free market system, you come to market, if you've got a good business, you stay relevant, you stay productive, you thrive. If you don't, you fail, that's it. And yeah. that, it's fair, everyone's got the same. But, wow. but now bailing the banks out and you've got corrupt individuals. Yeah, and you have a regulatory regime, yeah, Sam. Yeah. You, you have so many rules and regs that for small and medium-sized competitors to get into your industry is virtually impossible. Sam, powerful point. Um, I get on Twitter, how can a Corbyn government nationalise utilities when we know the EU will never let him. Well, you're quite right. The EU is generally very, very against things being nationalised. It wants them broken up and it wants two or three big multinationals to compete for the business. It's one of the things they've been telling the Greeks to do. Um, and, and, and one does wonder um, if a future Labour government was to keep us closely allied to the customs union and the single market, how they would actually be able to put their manifesto in place. It's a very good, strong, fair point. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's now 11.45. Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell wants a Labour government to take us back to the nationalisation of our services. He says it can be done without it costing any money. I really do wonder how that works. But just a quick thought. I know weekends... For a lot of people, sport is absolutely at the centre of it. And, of course, we've now got the Six Nations rugby. um, And and, and lots of you I know out there fascinated by how that pans out over the course of the next few weeks. And there will be, this afternoon, a game at Murrayfield between Scotland and France. And the game will begin with a little commemoration, given that we are now in 2018, and that 1918 was 100 years ago, a commemoration for rugby internationals who joined up, joined up the the army, um, and they were encouraged to do so with posters going up all over towns, talk of sportsmen's battalions and the use of famous footballers and rugby players and cricketers to get men to enlist. And they'll be commemorating the losses this afternoon. And I thought the numbers were really extraordinary. The Scots in the Great War had 31 rugby internationals killed in action. That's over two entire Scottish rugby teams killed in the First World War. The English had 28 killed, the French had 21 killed, the Welsh 14 killed, and Ireland 12 killed. Quite extraordinary numbers. And I guess fit young men 
you know, they weren't going to be put, they were not going to be put into service battalions uh, behind the lines. They were actually going to be frontline infantry soldiers and in many cases officers too. So just something, if you're watching the rugby this afternoon, you'll see before the kickoff that little commemoration and that's what it's all about. Gary says to me on Facebook, oh my God, I went on a Dartford loop line many a time. Great days, referring to Ruth, talking about the railways in the 50s and 60s. Stuart says, nationalisation en masse doesn't work as history has shown. John says, what is McDonald's plan for the inevitable tsunami of strikes? And Dave says, who is John McDonald? Oh dear, dear, dear. Dave, please do try and keep up with the main party. But a very important point being made here that I think, and let, let, let's face it, there is considerable anger about the way our public services are run, the money that is being seen to be creamed off the top. The issue that many people have is that our essential services are state-owned already but owned by foreign states. For example, much of our rail, energy and telecoms. Uh, this is why there is a groundswell behind Jeremy Corbyn's plan to renationalise these companies. And I have to say, it's been extraordinary, hasn't it? How foreign companies, often with a fair proportion of state ownership in them, have been able to buy up virtually the, the, the entire power industry in this country. And yet when we've wanted to buy shares in their companies across the rest of Europe. We've somehow been prevented from doing so. We should perhaps get Lord Digby Jones back on the show to talk about that. But yes, I think you're right. There is a, a strange feeling that we've sold off all these essential services to foreign companies with a big element of state ownership. So is, is John McDonnell right? Do we get rid of all these giant companies who we feel under under this system of corporatism are ripping us off. What does Claire and Edgware make of that? Yes, good morning, Mr. Farage. Good morning. Well, the fantastic Matt Fry show yesterday. We actually had this proposition that the Labour Party has expounded and explained to us yep. without the annoying interruptions from people like Andrew Marr, who, who has a congenital impossibility of keeping quiet. I mean, what they're saying is, these, first of all, it's not going to be the mass acquisitions of nationalisation. It's not the nationalisation that many of you people remember. I don't very well, but you all keep talking about yeah. how dreadful it was. What yeah. they're doing is this. They're going to exchange shares for bonds. Now, we all know if we have shares, they fluctuate wildly. Some years you do really well, other years you make virtually nothing. So what will happen is the government will guarantee the former shareholders a regular regular income from their bonds that they can rely on, but the days of huge bonuses, the days of massive payouts, the days of uh, CEOs getting two, three million a year, they are over. We will have managers managing the companies, local people who understand electricity, understand gas, understand water to actually run it, but because these are money generating businesses, they're not poverty struck, we all know they make a fortune. The money that they make will be returned to the companies. It will, must be invested, and that will be by statute, and they must use it to improve the uh, utility. And All this right. is why it appeals to intelligent young people. With regard to the railways, of course, when the franchises become available, we simply take them back. And in Germany, where they are state-owned, the Deutsche Bahn run them, but again... No big payouts to shareholders, no big bonuses, no big salaries. All the money goes back into the railways. And anybody who's ridden on German railways and French railways know they no, are Claire, fantastic. No, Claire, I've travelled I've travelled all over Europe by rail and, 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 you know, yeah. Look, I think what most people would say on railways, they couldn't care less whether it's owned by the state or, or whether it's private companies getting franchises as long as they run on time. But, Claire, let's get back to this first point. So let's just, for argument's sake, right... For argument's sake, I'm a private investor or I've got an allocation of my pension fund invested in a state service of some kind that John McDonnell decides he's going to nationalise. And, and the way you explained it to me was that my shares would get replaced by a bond that would pay me out a, that would pay me out a, a dividend of some kind. Yeah, it's a, it's a guaranteed dividend. I mean, as right. I say, it's essentially what they've got in Germany. You get it, it. The reason why it's attractive to people is to say, shares fluctuate. Sadly, I work in the NHS. Shares are a foreign entity to me. But yeah. what I do know, Nigel, is when I want to go up north to see my family, if anything happens 
say, if I get a WhatsApp yeah. today that says, something's happened, Claire, come up, I couldn't afford to pick I know, up I know, at, I know. at King's Cross and buy a ticket. And it would cost in you... In Germany, if I want... To, when I stay with my friends in Germany, <sighs> every Christmas, if we want to go to Berlin because we want to go to their fantastic um, Christmas markets, we just go to the station and we go because you can afford it. It costs you about, what... 60, 70 euros? No, I mean, Claire, look, you know, the argument, and I've done that, I've turned up, I've turned up and asked for a day return to Leeds, and, and I mean, I thought, God, you know, you sort of almost need a mortgage for that, it's crackers. But, but, but Claire, if, if, all I'm worried about is if my pension fund or my private savings are converted into bonds and a dividend, that means I can't get my cash out. That means I've been robbed, I think. But Claire, you put a passionate case for what, for what John McDonnell is saying. In terms of nationalisation, we need to take them into state control. Let's take back control, someone says. A sort of slight joke on the referendum. Let's try Phil in Reading. Good morning, Phil. Good morning, Nigel. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, I'd just like to say very briefly, you are a shining light in the world of politics, and I just wish that the political establishment would take notice of you. Because everything you have to say, I agree with. You're just absolutely... Oh, Phil, brilliant. they take notice of me. They absolutely loathe me. But um, now, but now, I'm really worried, Phil, that McDonald wants to... I mean, I, I'm not actually, a, you know, a big private shareholder, but I'm worried that actually his plan to convert shareholdings into bonds virtually amounts to theft, doesn't it? Well, I, I can see what you're saying. That does make perfect sense. However... Um, I think what we have thought of as nationalised industries goes way back to the 70s when the Labour governments were very much in control. The unions had a stranglehold on this country. Oh, yes. And the, co the combination of the two meant that everything was terrible. The threats of three-day weeks and things like this, strikes all the time, it was just a nightmare. However, if we took back certain key... Um, services into public ownership, run under a conservative government or a more right-wing government, uh, you know, run properly as businesses. What would I you, Phil, 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 what would you define as key? Um, I would say key things like gas, electricity, Ooh. water. But you're talking, like but Phil, you're talking here. You're talking here about a massive nationalisation programme. I mean, it would almost sort of rival what Clement Attlee was doing back in 1945. Yes. You know, it, it would have to be something that was done gradually over All right. a period of time. OK. It, Phil, I've run out of time. I've run out of time. But really interesting that Phil thinks this needs to be a massive programme, but phased in over a period of time. I'll tell you what, this debate McDonald started, you're going to hear a lot more of over the course of the next couple of years. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show. I'm back tomorrow night at 7. Coming up at 3 o'clock this afternoon, it's Alex Salmond. But up next, it's Martin Stamford. And at 1 o'clock, actually, we're going to kick around the nationalisation ideas as well.